usually. But if, say, like, potentially that's cultured way, so we could use that to, like, inoculate something else, potentially. Mm -hmm. Just to put it out there. Um, and then I add in water, the same amount of water into it. And that helps the, both the cutting and the diluting help the curd to get firmer. Um, and so I basically put it and leave it in the hay box after I've done that process of diluting and cutting the curd. I leave it in there for another half an hour to an hour. You can leave it in there for up to an, two hours if you wanted to, and maybe it would make a difference. But it should be fine otherwise. It might like, start to decompose or something like that. Um, at that point, I take all of that um, whey and curds, and I pour it into a colander over a pot, so I get almost all of the whey to come out, and I just have the curds. And then I take those curds and I put them in a mold, a cheese mold, um, which is, you know, like Crisco shortening containers? You guys familiar with those? Big Anyone? margarine tubs, basically. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I basically have a plastic tub. It's, this is nothing sophisticated. It's just like you could use a Nancy's yogurt container. And I've taken a hot nail, and on the inside, I poked holes all throughout it, about like half inch intervals, all the way around it and in the bottom. And that's like the mold that I use. It doesn't have to be super fancy. Um, and this cheese, I don't have, I'm not utilizing a press to press the cheese or anything like that. I just have a mold and I gravity press it. So I put those curds into the mold and I allow them to sit there for 20 minutes or so. This is preferably still in the hay box or in the insulated box because you want it to stay at about 100 degrees for as long as you can because it helps the bacteria. Um, 85 to 100 degrees, that's really optimal temperature range. Um, and again, that's foolproofing the process to make sure that the, the bacteria have a good home and are getting started well. And so I'll leave it, the disc, there for about 20 minutes and then wash my hands and I'll take it out of the mold and flip it over. And so the cheese gets flipped over inside the mold and that makes sure that it's getting compressed evenly by gravity so you get a uniform size and you get a solid mass of cheese. If you do it poorly, you get like lopsided cheese, or it's like hard, it's like firm on one side and kind of not so firm on the other side. Yeah. It also helps the moisture to move equally throughout the cheese, because um, you don't necessarily want all the moisture to drop out really quickly. You kind of want most of the moisture to come out, and then slowly over the course of the aging for the moisture to leave. So you get most of the moisture out, so you're not in danger of like mold growing on it, etc. So I usually do that flipping 20 minute intervals for an hour, maybe two hours, depending on what's going on. And so that's a relatively intensive process, but you could do it maybe like one side for a half an hour, another side for a half an hour, maybe do it two more times, and you'll have a nice, relatively solid cheese. Um, and then after that, I put the cheese in a brine. And that brine helps to suck a little bit more moisture out and allow salt to infiltrate into it. That helps it preserve the outside, at least, uh, from surface molds growing on it and other types of uh, bacteria from getting inside. And it helps it form a natural crust uh, that's not bacteria-based. Because oftentimes they have like penicillin or something that they uh, spray onto the cheese to form a bacterial crust. And that helps to inoculate it with bacteria that's not harmful and creates a, a biological barrier uh, so the cheese can cure in relative security. Um, so this brine, when you put it in yeah. the brine, what do you mean you put it, so you have this, this, this cheese that you've had in this, and you're doing the turning yep, of yep. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then you plop it out of there into, into a, a brine pot? Yep, into a pot that has salty and water in it. And still the warm brine pot? Or it doesn't have to be warm, it can be room temperature. Okay. Warm is good. Uh, just keeping the cheese warm is good. Like so that. you just pop it into the brine. Yeah. And the trick that I have for making sure that the brine is the right concentration is I take like a potato, uh -huh. which is like that big or so, and I put it in there. And if a quarter sized bit of the potato is floating uh, in the brine, then you know it's strong enough for what you're doing. That's just an old Swiss trick <laughs> for determining the concentration of the brine. Um, and I leave it in there for maybe. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and I flip it over just to make sure, because the cheese is going to float in there, so you want it to be on both sides equally. So it goes in there for about an hour, 
uh, 30 minutes on each side. That's a good little chunk. And then from there, I take it. Yeah. Can you reuse that brine from day to day? You can reuse it from day to day. If your cheese is nice and hard, you won't have much like stuff that goes in to the brine. Um, if it's sort of like still liquidy, it tends to come out, and you'll need to change it eventually. Uh, if you have animals and whatnot, it's just salty water, so you can cook stuff in it and feed it to animals or whatnot. It's all good for them. Um, from there, I let it air dry for several days. So I put it on like a baking rack on a pan, and I just flip it every couple of hours to make sure that the moisture is moving out and that it's just air drying. And the air drying is helpful for uh, keeping the mold from growing on it, basically. Um, and then it's basically every day for the next week or so, you flip it over to make sure that the moisture doesn't settle to the bottom of inside of the cheese. You want it to be the moisture to be moving slightly through it and working its way out. So if you have it sitting there, it'll tend to like make a crater and it'll be soggy on the bottom and dry on the top. So you want to make sure that you're flipping it. Um, and I don't always do that super well, so I have some weird looking cheeses. It's all good. I'm not going to like ruin it. It's just if you're trying to be like perfect, with like this perfect cheese, then flipping it every day is really important in the early parts. And then you can just kind of look at it over the next several weeks and maybe every couple of days turn it over to make sure that if you're starting to see little bits of mold potentially growing on the outside, you can brine it again or just put some really salty water on the mm -hmm. surface. Not kill the bacteria because it's salty. Mm -hmm. And uh, this cheese I aged for three weeks. You could age it for longer. If you put wax on it, you could age it for five years and you probably have a great, crazy. Um, you can age it for as long as you want in a variety of different conditions. That doesn't mean that you're going to get a different. very similar to a non-aged cheese. Um, so if you're going for the complex flavor of an aged cheese, then you want it to be aged longer. So there needs to be a good time frame on that. In general, you want like a relatively humid room that stays at about 85 degrees. That's like optimal for a cheese curing. Uh, at least mesophilic bacteria, because it's like right at the low end of their preferred temperature range, so it means it's a, like a long, slow process. But still, you still get a lot of curing done in a short period of time, in the three-week period. You can also do it at lower temperatures and lower humidities, uh, but you'll probably get a drier cheese, and you'll probably really take longer to get the same amount of complexity. If you have it too hot, it tends to turn acidic more quickly, and you get a less complex flavor and it's more acidic tasting and drier, the moisture tends to come out. Um, if it's in a relatively hot and humid thing, uh, environment, perhaps it won't be dry, but you'll have a much higher likelihood of mold growing on it. So I think it's like 70 degrees, 70% 70 humidity is like a really nice amount of humidity for cheese curing. Um, but you also want constant airflow as well. So you want humidity and good airflow. And that's somewhat hard to do. But they, you know, they used to age cheeses in caves where it's like relatively cool but humid. And so you can age cheeses for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the process that I use. All of that is outlined in more detail on the website. So if you're looking to try that out, it's a good general recipe. And you can tweak it. As you, as you see fit. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Ricky Carroll is the name of the, uh, the woman who started uh, the New England Cheese Company. So she has a lot of books and a website, cheesemaking.com, I'm pretty sure is what it's called. Uh, and those are all excellent resources. There's hundreds of different types of cheese that she goes into and then lots of information about how you can tweak the recipes and make things that are slightly different. Mm -hmm. And again, we're working with goat cheese Goat cheese has its own particular properties. It's different than cows. We're dealing with whole, raw, fresh goat cheese. Goat milk, right? So that's our input. 
and that gives very specific um, results. And you're actually going to get more cheese from goat's milk because they have a higher fat content, so more protein, more fat, so you're going to get more cheese. Uh, sheep's milk has the highest fat and protein content, so if you have some sheep that like to be milked, I would suggest milking your sheep. And, and therein lies the, the funny thing though, because one cow can produce a gallon or two gallons of milk per day, and you know, these three goats that we had produced one gallon, and a sheep would, you know, three or, or five sheep <laughs> would produce even less. So although you're getting more cheese per gallon of milk, it's how many sheep do you have to have. Um, and then it's all distinct flavors like we were talking about earlier, each different animal, each different season of animal, yep. you know, has mm -hmm. a different flavor of, of cheese and, and yogurt and, and um, yeah, so it's... Yep. At different stages of lactation, the animals have different butter fat contents and different protein mm -hmm. contents. So oftentimes with cows, they say traditionally that you make a lot of butter early on because early in lactation there's high energy, lots of more fat early on, uh, and that's basically to get the babies going, mm -hmm. right, and getting them onto solid feet. That's like mm -hmm. naturally the mother's pulling lots more energy into the milk, and so you have more fat, and you want to make butter with that, right? This is with cows. Um, it's hard to make butter with goat's milk, but that's a different. That's, uh, slightly longer time. Explain? Yeah, just a little sure. bit. Sure. Goat's milk, the fat particles in goat's milk are smaller than the fat particles in cow's milk. So goat's milk is naturally homogenized in the sense that it takes a very long time for the solids to, to rise to the surface uh, through just the physical process of rising to the surface. Mm -hmm. Whereas in cow's milk, they're significantly different in size from the water, so they're much more likely to, much quickly, uh, more quickly go to the surface of the milk or the whey, the watery portion of the milk. Yeah, it separates quite quickly actually. Mm -hmm. When you have raw cow's milk, you'll get the cream top and then the skim milk on the bottom, where mm -hmm. goat's milk it doesn't do that. It doesn't separate out, or it, it takes would, three or but, four days yeah. in the fridge and you'll get a definitive cream layer, but you don't get a crisp of a separation. Yeah. Uh, if, they, if they separate it out uh, in an industrial process, they use a centrifuge, and they spin the milk, and then they suck the, the heavier particles, they suck them up, um, and then they're left over with 